talking about um, fivefold ministry and that specifically dealing with the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. I'm going to take some time to define that, but I'm going to spend most of my time tonight focusing on why we need fivefold ministry and what a church looks like that is it is, is literally being governed and is receiving that ministry of, of, of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, and teacher. So if you're there, um, Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to read to you verses 11 through 13 out of the New Living Translation. It says, now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Now listen to this. Their responsibility is to equip God's people, come on, to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. It is not their responsibility to grow the church, to get the people in, to do even the discipleship, but their responsibility is to equip the people of God to do the work, build up the church, the body of Christ. Now listen to this, verse, verse 13. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Verse 13 tells us how long will the ministry of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher continue? Until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Do you know what that literally means? It means that the church becomes such a force on the earth, united, that we look like one man. So, is that the way we see the church right now, by and large? No. So, where do we get off on saying that the apostle and prophet are no longer for today? They will continue until the church comes to that place. Now, some people have a problem with this type of theology, but frankly, I think they have a problem with the Word of God or their understanding of the Word of God. The truth is, Jesus is coming back for a glorious church, a church full of glory. I, I am not saying that there, you know, that there's not persecution in the world. I'm not, I'm not being oblivious to that and that the church is, is suffering in many parts of the world. But the fact is that when you read the book of Acts, even in the midst of incredible persecution, the glory and the grace and the power of Jesus Christ was being demonstrated in the midst of all of that darkness. So, the gifting of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, teacher is to continue until the church comes to that place where we have become mature in the Lord and we're measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. We're like one man. So the church comes to that authentic unity in the faith, the true knowledge of Jesus, not just theology, not just doctrine, but literally the word there means to know personally, to know intimately. We know Jesus in that measure, to that degree, that we become fully developed, exact representations of Jesus on the earth. We are called to be little Christ. We were saved not just to go to heaven, but to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. How many know that Romans 8, 28 says, for all things work together for good to those that love God, those are the called according to his purpose. Now, do you know how things work together for good? All things work together for good to those that love God, those that are called according to his purpose? The next verse, verse 29. Romans 8 says, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness or the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus is my big brother. 
Now you are to be like Jesus. How do all things work together for good? And you lose your job, you go through a trial, you go through a difficulty. It's not just in that, okay, I know that I lost my job, but God's going to give me another job. Thank God for his provision. But there is a purpose that is more powerful and more significant than that. The purpose is in the midst of all of your trials and all the things that you go through in life, even what the devil means to destroy you with, God is using it as you submit to him to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. We, 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 we don't have time to go into this, but you know, Jesus calmed the storm when his disciples were in the boat, but then later on he sent them out into the midst of a storm. And it wasn't until they had to personally go through the storm and learn how to overcome the storm that they were being conformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So we are to be conformed to his likeness and we are to live as Jesus lived on the earth. 1 John 2, 6 says, If anyone says he abides in him, let him walk even as he himself walked. We are not only to live like him, but we're to do what he did. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you, the works that I do shall you do also, and even greater works, because I'm going to my Father. So we are being conformed to the likeness of Jesus. Why? That we may bring heaven to earth. That we may bring the glory of God to the earth. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Jesus was called in, by Paul in Romans the second Adam. Do you know that Jesus, when he came to the earth, he did not come merely just to die on the cross for you, for me. He came not just to go to the cross. That was certainly the most important thing, but he came and he lived among us for three and a half years and he modeled, he exemplified, he showcased what a man who is controlled by the Holy Spirit and who his sins are, her sins are covered is to live like. He came as the second Adam. He came literally to show what Adam was to look like, how he was to live. Jesus did not, he was tempted in every way, but he did not give in to that temptation. He came to show us how we are to live. Now, there's a lot of people that believe, a lot of Christians, well-meaning Christians, that believe that Jesus came to die for my sins so that I might not go to hell. That's it. Yes, he died so that you would be forgiven, that I would be forgiven. Thank God for that. And he died so that we would not go to hell, but we could spend eternity with him. But if that is the only reason or even the primary purpose for Jesus coming to the world, then I want to tell you something. The moment you became born again, the moment I became born again, he would have killed us. Because he knew we'd mess it up. But he left us here for a purpose. The Bible says that Jesus was not only called the second Adam, but he was called the Son of Man. And Jesus was created in the image and likeness of God, just as Adam and Eve were. And the scripture says yet, in Colossians 1.19, that it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. While he was on the earth, in him all the fullness should dwell. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Hebrew says that he is the exact representation of the Father. So, understand something now. Jesus is gone. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's left us here on planet Earth. And we are his body. We are to live the way he created us to live. We're to walk in the fullness of the Spirit. We are to carry the glory of God. We are to live that overcoming life that Jesus exemplified when he was on planet Earth. In Ephesians 1.23, just, just put your seatbelt on for a moment. Ephesians 1.23 in the Amplified Bible, are you ready for this? It says the church is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. Now listen, for in that body lives the full measure of him. 
In the body lives the full measure of him. In other words, we should be able to say to the world, you want to see God? Look at the church. For in him, that body lives the full measure of him who makes everything complete and who fills everything everywhere with himself. Oh, hallelujah. That is whom we have been created to be. Containing his glory. Living the life that God has created us to live in Christ Jesus. The church is to manifest, to exemplify, to demonstrate the life of Jesus Christ on the earth. Hallelujah. Now, let me tell you that it is impossible for the church to develop fully and grow up into our destiny without the input and contribution of fivefold ministry offices. Here's why. See, fivefold ministry is actually what I call the maturity mechanism of the church. It's a maturity mechanism. It's through fivefold ministry that we become mature. That we become everything that Jesus created us to be. You see, the scripture tells us that each office imparts and deposits a measure of grace. Let me ask you something. The number five is the number what? That represents grace. It represents a number of grace. Now, there is the apostle, there is the prophet, there is the evangelist, there is the pastor and the teacher. Together, they represent the full measure of the grace of God being demonstrated on the earth. Acts 4.33 says, With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. The word literally is mega grace. Now, I want grace, because you know grace, sometimes we confuse grace for mercy. Mercy is the forgiveness of sin, but grace is the divine influence working in us to will and to do his good purpose. The grace of God, Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. Power was manifested. You know, sin, you, you sin will have no dominion over you because you're not under law, but you're under what? Grace. So it's the power of God operating in you and through you. That is what grace is. Enabling you not just merely to be forgiven of your sin, not just merely to be pardoned of your sin, thank God for that, but to walk in power, to walk in authority, to become an overcomer in this life, in this world. That's what grace is. And the scripture says that there was great grace, mega grace, that rested upon the early church in Jerusalem. It was with great power that the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. When, when, the, when the ministry of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, and teacher is released, when it converges and when it comes together, then there's something that happens. The full measure of God's grace is released. And as that happened, see, the early church was so powerful was because they were experiencing the full measure of God's grace and they were releasing it to the world. Now, not everybody who says they're an apostle is an apostle. Not everyone who says they're a prophet is a prophet. And we also recognize that we can certainly uh, not walk in the fullness of our potential as well. There's, there is a, uh, a cost, there is a, a requirement a, that, that, that is contingent upon us to walk in in order to manifest the fullness of the anointing and that measure and that deposit of grace that God has given to us. But nevertheless, we understand that without apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, we cannot become everything that God wants us to become. That's why staying home and watching the TV evangelist isn't enough. You've got to come. You see, and, 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 and there's something Paul spoke about impartation in Romans and, and chapter 1. And, you know, there's something that just happens, not just when you hear the word of the Lord being taught. That's important. But we have to have instruction, but we also have to have impartation. And an impartation is when you get around someone, for example, 
that, that has a healing ministry, then all of a sudden, that rubs off on you. When I was first entered ministry, I, was, I was, had the privilege of sitting under and being tutored by someone who had a very profound healing ministry. And I had the privilege of sitting at that person's feet, of working uh, for that person. And as a result of that, what ended up happening is I began to go out. And you know what? It wasn't so much that there was even on the laying on of hands. Because at the first time it happened, he hadn't even laid hands on me. But I went out to a church in northern Canada. It was a French-speaking community, and, and they were all Catholics. And, and I went up there, and the first night, a, a, a young man came in, and he was blind. And, and I prayed for him, and God instantly opened his eyes. And all of a sudden, during the course of the next few days, I started getting words of knowledge, and God would begin to tell me about the sicknesses and the diseases that people had, and they would get healed. Now... It was just something that just kind of rubbed off on me. It transferred him. See, that's why we need to be around five-fold ministry. Now, there is a call to apostolic anointing and apostolic authority. That is not for everybody, but all believers are called to heal the sick. Amen? Amen. We're all called to evangelize, even though we may not be an evangelist per se. But we come to that place that... That impartation and that instruction is so critical in our lives. We'll never become everything, everything that Jesus wants us to be individually and collectively as a church without the input of the fivefold ministry. Now, the body of Christ will in fact become unbalanced, asymmetrical. We've got to have the input of all fivefold ministry. Let me really quickly define the fivefold ministry. The apostle. I mean, just very quickly, the apostle actually governs. The prophet guides, the evangelist gathers, the pastor guards, and the teacher grounds. Let me just share with you a little bit about apostolic, and we're going to get into this in more detail because you're going to see in Ephesians chapter 2, I believe it's verse number 20, that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostle and prophet. But the apostle, his, his role is really bringing governance and order. And in fact, it's very interesting that when you, when you look at the various gift mixes that, uh, you know, for example, I have an apostolic anointing, I have a prophetic anointing, and I have a teaching anointing. God uses me in all those ways. Sometimes when I go over to Africa, like Enrico and I are about to do, I move into that evangelistic anointing that mantle but i'm primarily an apostolic person it's very interesting when you study the new testament you will see apostle or you'll see prophet as the dominant gift and then there may be another gift that goes with it for example acts 13 there were prophets and teachers there are apostles and teachers there are apostles that have a prophetic anointing on them for example we know that that silas was an apostle but he's also called a prophet Paul is also prophetic. So the apostle governs. His job really consists of, you can look throughout the scripture again. We don't have time to go into this in detail, but he brings the leadership. He brings the government. He brings the organization. He's also foundational. He brings order. He brings government. He brings resources. The apostle is involved in, in breaking ground. He's, he's a wise master builder, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.10. Literally, the Greek, he's an architect. He's foundational. He takes the gospel to people that haven't heard the gospel at times. But he's able to bring order. He's able to, to raise up others. Apostles impart. Apostles raise up others for ministry. Through the hands of the apostle, many signs and wonders were wrought. Acts chapter 5, verse number 12. Acts 19, verse 11. God worked unusual miracles through the hands of Paul. Also an apostle. Unusual miracles. Literally extraordinary miracles. These are off the chain miracles we're talking about now. And this was through the hands of an apostle. All saints have the healing uh, gift. We have the ability to be able to heal the sick. But not all of us have that apostolic authority to work extraordinary, unusual, or as the King James says, special miracles. But God uses such men, such women to go into places and break something wide open. 
had the privilege recently of seeing this happen. I was ministering in the Midwest in the United States and uh, in a church, and what happened was uh, people were being healed, and uh, one night uh, I gave an invitation if you needed healing, if you needed a miracle in your life, and I looked down and I saw a couple. I, uh, I, I looked at the man, and the Holy Spirit began to speak to me about about medical doctor. That's all I heard, medical doctor. I said, sir, are you a medical doctor? He said, no, I'm not. I thought, man, I missed the Lord on this. But I, I thought to myself, well, you're up to something here, God. I, I don't understand it all. But I said, now, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm an engineer. And, and at the point where I was just beginning, well, I don't know what's going on here, God. Give me a word. Give me a word. At that moment, his wife says, but pastor... We came here tonight because my father-in-law, my husband's father, he's a medical doctor. And he's sick, and he needs a healing in his body. I found out that this family is from India. They have a Hindu background. They heard about the miracles. They had recently come to know the Lord, but they heard about the miracles. They were in a church that doesn't believe in miracles. That's what they had been attending. And I didn't know that, but I told them, I said, I don't know what's going on in your life, but the Holy Spirit just said that he's going to do something in your life and he's going to fill you and touch you in such a profound way that you're not going to be able to go back to whatever church you attend because frankly, you're just not going to get fed in there anymore. That happened, by the way. She pulled out of her bag. She had a, a sweater or a, actually a shirt. And she said, I want you to anoint this because my father-in-law needs healed. We anointed that. Father-in-law, who's a medical doctor himself, was tormented. Tormented. Couldn't sleep at night. De depression, torment, blood pressure off the charts. They tried everything they could to stabilize it. Nothing worked. They put the shirt on him. <laughs> and they told him, wear this to bed, Dad. Ended up that night, he went to sleep, woke up in the morning. His blood pressure had dropped. To this day, is completely stabilized. The depression and the discouragement and the torment stopped that night, the moment that shirt literally was placed on him. Jesus. Now, now that's, that's cool. But let me tell you what the purpose of it. That you may know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins. I say to you. Arise and take up your bed. Listen to me. The purpose is to manifest the power of Jesus Christ. Not just to meet a physical need, but to manifest the fact that Jesus Christ is the only one who can take away your sins. That Jesus Christ is Lord. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he is the way and the truth and the life. Here's what ended up happening. We prayed that night and, and God gave me a prophetic word about a financial miracle that was going to come to pass in two months. And they just called us or emailed us and said that, you know, there was money that was owed, and, and I told them, I said, it has to do with money that was owed to you, and, and they said, and, and my husband went to work, and they said, you know what, guess what, we, we've decided we're going to release this money to you, and they said, Pastor, you'll never guess, but we, he, they're releasing the money to us on this date, and it was January, whatever, and they said it was exactly two months to the day. Amen. Amen. And, they, and they said, now, here's what we want to tell you. You prayed for my family members in India. Hindus and they were all healed I said what they were all healed how many were there well they're like about a dozen they were healed you see what that did that miracle was it gave them faith to believe God and God began to do miracles and he began to break into this family this Hindu family and demonstrate his glory it was foundational in the sense that it broke new ground now an apostle can be used to go into a region and do that an apostle has that mandate that calling that anointing on his life her life to be able to do that in a city that's why this church is an apostolic center it's not just about you coming here to have your needs met you will have your needs met, but your needs being met is for a purpose that you may take the city, that you may exercise his dominion on the earth, that you may set the captives free. See, that's the purpose of it. So that's the apostolic. The prophetic gives guidance. Apostolic release for increase, and then there's prophetic correction for direction. 
prophetic correction is that sometimes the prophet comes and says, don't go this way. Sometimes the prophet brings a word of confirmation. Sometimes the word brings, he brings a word of, 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 of uh, consolation to you. But the purpose of it is to encourage, to edify, to lift you up. Not as a substitute for you hearing the voice of God yourself. But to confirm. And sometimes when you won't listen to God yourself, that word can come to bring correction into your life. You see, the prophet is to help bring guidance. The evangelist gathers. Philip was an event, a, a great example of an evangelist in the Bible. He gathered. He gathered. What happens? People began to be saved in Samaria. Miracles happen. And what takes place next is, you know, he realizes, hey, we've got to do something about this. There's enough people here that are coming to the Lord that we've got to do something to disciple this people. And he recognized that that was not his calling. That was in his mantle. So he sends for he lets the apostles know up in Jerusalem what's going on. Peter and John come down. Peter and John lay hands on them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter and John at that point literally begin to organize what is happening. They begin to bring structure and, and government to what was going on there. You might want to say that they planted an apostolic center or a church, but they bring organization to that. And then they ended up, they stayed and, and they discipled the people for a period of time eventually appointed leadership. Again, we don't have time to get into all of the uh, roles and responsibilities of fivefold ministry. The pastor guards. The pastor literally is a shepherd. The pastor is to watch out over your soul. The pastor is to help give guidance to you, but the pastor is also a teacher in that sense, that the pastor is to ground you and to help teach the Word of God to you. Again, it does not negate from your responsibility, my responsibility, to dig into the Word and to seek the face of God ourselves. But it's to bring that type of, of, of manifestation to our lives. And there's just something that happens when we sit under the teaching of others. And, and you know, you see these churches all over, these churches, unfortunately, that... that lack the input and the involvement of all fivefold ministry. You know, churches, for example, that, have, that emphasize evangelism. We're a soul winning church. We have 699 buses in our parking lot. We win souls. But often people are taught and discipled in the deeper life. I have a friend that planted a church next to a mega church. I won't say the name of the mega church. It's up north. And what ended up happening is he did not do this intentionally. God spoke to him and said, plant a church in a very, very affluent suburb of a major city. And what ended up happening is people started coming to his church, getting healed, delivered, and baptized with the Holy Spirit. And what he found out later on is that people were saying, I got saved here and it, it was good, but then something, you know, there was a yearning and there was a desire in me to go deeper with God and I just couldn't find it in that church and ended up that God just led him down the street a few blocks into his church. Some churches stress the prophetic in an unbalanced way at the exclusion of evangelism, at the exclusion of discipleship. The people are constantly seeking the next word from God, but they never fulfill the last words of God. Go into all the world and make disciples of the nations. Other churches teach and teach and teach doctrine. And yet the people never witness the signs and wonders that are manifested primarily through the office of the evangelist and the apostle. We have to have all fivefold ministry. There is a better way. First Peter 4.10 says, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. We are all called to minister one to another. We're talking about fivefold ministry tonight, so I'll just kind of restrict it to that context. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. There we go again. That word manifold literally means multifaceted. The Amplified Bible says many-sided. 
the grace of God that has many sides. A diamond has, has many sides and, and can be multifaceted, but not one single facet in itself is a, is a diamond. You need, the, you need all the facets, you need all the sides to come together to create that diamond. So, so we see the importance of the fivefold ministry. Now let me tell you Ephesians 2, 19 and 20 says that these dual offices, the office of apostle and prophet, are foundational to the church. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. Now listen to this, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God has appointed these in the church. Who appointed? God appointed first, what? Apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. There is not even a reference to the pastor there. But first the apostle, secondarily the prophet. Why is the office of apostle and prophet given the preeminence in the New Testament? It's because they literally create the environment from which all other ministries emerge. In other words, the apostolic and prophetic is the seedbed of the church. What is apostolic? Again, apostolos is the word. It literally means to send forth or to send out. Two primary characteristics of apostolic foundation and demonstration. The apostle lays foundation the apostle moves in demonstration. The apostle is able to build, in other words, and he is able to bring a boom. The prophet, literally prophetes, signifies the speaking forth of the mind and the counsel of God. In classical Greek, the word was used literally of one who would interpret what an idol was saying, what a God was saying. Would interpret what the God was saying because the God didn't have a voice of his own. So, what is the prophetic? The prophetic deals with revelation and proclamation. Revelation, knowing the mind and the counsel of God and proclamation, declaring it, revealing it. So we conclude that the foundational mission of the church is to reach and to preach, is to go and gab. We are to go out and we are to reach people that don't know Jesus Christ. We are to demonstrate the power of God. We are to be proactive, not passive, in setting people free. Prophecy, knowing the mind of God, declaring it. Let me tell you that currently right now, most churches in North America are not reaching the lost. 70 to 80% of our churches are in decline or recline. That means plateau. And among the 20% of our churches that are quote-unquote growing in this nation, less than 5% are growing as a result of reaching the unsaved. In other words... Most of our quote-unquote growing churches are growing simply through transfer growth. And there's, I know and I recognize people change jobs. They move from one city to another. They need to find a church. I recognize that some churches are dead and, and you, you can't stay there. And God gets a hold of you and brings you into church where there's life. Like the sheep that, you know, ended up, became so emaciated and skinny that he crawled under the fence and he went to greener pastures and, and he ended up by that he got so fat that when he tried to go back, he couldn't squeeze through the fence. That's what happens. I recognize that. But only a single county in this nation has had a net increase in, in church growth since 1963. Honolulu County. You see... We are in a place where we need to see an increase. And what we have to do is we have to shift. We have to make an intentional paradigm shift from pastoral 
led churches that are maintenance oriented to apostolic churches that are mission focused and are literally concentrating on equipping and raising up other people to do the work of the ministry and not just the pastor or the pastors doing all the ministry themselves. And not in their own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we need. I believe we have in this nation created a culture, an environment, a climate that has stifled the church from fulfilling our their purpose. We have a bless me event oriented entertainment model of church where I go to church. You don't go to church. You are the church of the living God and you take the church to wherever you go whether it's at work in the shopping mall or on the mission fields. Now the early church was a governing church. They preached and they demonstrated a kingdom and a government. Isaiah 9, 7 says that they had a good government. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Speaking of Jesus, upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, it would be ordered and established with judgment and justice. Let me tell you something about the purpose of fivefold ministry. Ephesians 4, 12 says that the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, and teacher is given to the church as a grace gift, as an office to equip the saints, to equip believers, Christians, to do the work of ministry and build up the body of Christ, correct? That word is translated perfect in the King James Version. In the NIV, I believe it's translated prepare. But that term is a very interesting word. It literally means to thoroughly furnish or to set in order. It's also translated to prepare, another time to repair, in fact, in classical Greek, it's used of a bone that had been broken and was fused and put back together again. Interestingly, the, the root word is found in Matthew 4, 21, where the word is translated mend when Jesus was walking along the shore and he saw James and John it's literally fixing or mending their, their, their dad's fishing nets. What am I saying? <laughs> we must recognize that the purpose of ministry, of fivefold ministry, is to repair you in order to prepare you. Before you can be moved into your destiny, you need to be mended from your misery. You, you know, there are a lot of people that want to go into ministry and they're not healthy, you know what I'm saying? And, and then the grenade goes off and everybody gets hit by shrapnel. But God wants you to be repaired. And then some churches specialize in that, don't they? And then there's like, man, I'm so thankful Jesus has healed my body. He's healed my mind. He's healed my marriage. He's made me whole. My finances are great. Praise God. Well, guess what? He repaired you in order to prepare you, not so you can just bask in what he's done for you. There's a story in the Bible of Peter's mother-in-law. Yes, Peter was married and he had a mother-in-law. And the Bible says that Jesus left the synagogue and he went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. And Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And they came to Jesus and they immediately told her about him. They told Jesus about her. So Jesus goes in to her. He takes her by her hand, helps her up. One translation says that he rebuked the fever. One of the accounts in the gospel say that he rebuked the fever and immediately she was healed. What did she do after she was healed? She said, thank you, Jesus. I'm going shopping. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to church. She got up and she served. You see, he repairs you to prepare you. He makes you whole for the purpose. And an apostolic church says, come on in here. We'll cast the demon out of you. We'll heal you. We'll make sure that Jesus gives you a sound mind. We'll get your marriage in order. We'll get your life in order so you can go out and be a force on this earth. Amen. And it close with this illustration. In the New Testament, it's very interesting. When Jesus commenced his ministry, he started with the fishing miracle. 
Luke chapter 5 is the first story. And then again, in the end of his three and a half years of ministry, there's another fishing miracle story in John chapter 21. In the first story, Luke chapter 5, Simon and Peter and, and the guys, they had been fishing all night. You know the story. Couldn't catch a thing. So what happens is Jesus says, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Initially, Simon hesitates, but eventually he complies. And then we're told in verse number 6, and when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish. And it says, and their net was breaking. Now, please remember that the purpose of this story is to illustrate that Jesus was going to make them fishers of men. Because after this fishing miracle happened, they, let the, they literally left the fish to rot and stink on the shore and went and followed Jesus. But then, later on, now Jesus is dead. He's left them. What are we going to do, guys? Peter says, I go a-fishing. No, don't you love the King James? I go a-fishing. We don't know. There might have been economic motives behind this. These guys weren't, you know, hobby fishermen. These guys were commercial fishermen. I'm going fishing. All right, Peter, we'll go with you. Next thing you know, some guy yells at them, catch anything? No, nothing. And he says, cast a net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Hmm, deja vu. Can we see this somewhere? I think I dreamed about this. So, they listen. They cast the net on the right side of the boat. And the scripture says that Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153, which St. Jerome says indicates all the nations of the world. And what ends up happening is it says that although there were so many, the net was not broken. The first time, go deep, the net broke. The second time, and we're told to go deep, but they were told to throw the net on the right side. You see, what's happened now is, in the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he says, I will make you fishers of men. But guess what, guys? You're not ready yet. Guess what, guys? <laughs> Some of you are going to cock an attitude. Some of you are going to deny me. Some of you are, are, are going to, you know, uh, just think that you're the greatest thing to grace planet Earth. You're not ready. The net is going to break if I send you out now. It's not just a case that it, this was pre-resurrection and that post-resurrection made all the difference. No, 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 no. Jesus spent three years pouring into them, investing, teaching, and training them. And Jesus was fivefold ministry, literally incarnate. And what did he do? At the end of that three years, they failed, they forsook him. But yet, now Jesus says, throw the net in. And this time, the net does not break. Why? The right side speaks of authority. Speaks of authority. You guys are ready. You need the Holy Spirit. Wait in Jerusalem. To tarry there until you receive power from on high. That after you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, then you go out and you make disciples of the nations. You see, it's about mission. It's not just, well, I come to an apostolic center and I don't like it. I can't get a counseling appointment. Or, or you know what? what? What happens to a sheep that constantly, constantly wanders off? Do you know what the shepherd does? Breaks the sheep's leg. A sheep that's going to constantly wander off. He doesn't have time to deal with that. He's done everything he could to prepare that sheep, to teach it the right way, but that, that sheep has a streak of stubbornness and self-will in it. And so what happens is God says, look it, I have saved you, not so you can go to church and just say, bless me, bless me, bless me. But I have saved you in order to make you whole for a purpose. To heal you for a purpose, for mission. So that you can understand the gifts that God has for your life. 
and you can begin to move in the anointing that he has for you and you can begin to pour out and to invest in other people's lives and you can build up the body of Christ qualitatively and quantitatively. That's the purpose for fivefold ministry. The Great Commission, it is a co-mission. Jesus said he's not going to do it on his own. We can't do it without him. The purpose of the Great Commission is to establish the kingdom of God on the earth. Number one, extend the boundaries. He said, go, extend the boundaries of my kingdom. Secondly, educate my subjects regarding their rights and responsibilities. Teach them all things. Educate them regarding their rights and responsibilities, kingdom protocol, kingdom culture, kingdom standards, your expectations, as well as, as the benefits and the blessings that are yours as a son, as a daughter of the king. And then lastly, a good king, a good government will eradicate injustice and oppression from, the land, from his territory, from his domain. What are we to do? We're to eradicate injustice and oppression. The Bible says that when Jesus was on the earth, he went around doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. You were created to destroy the works of the devil. You were created to submit to the ministry and the working and the anointing of the fivefold ministry that will set you free, that will heal you and that will make you whole and will give you and fur thoroughly furnish you with everything you need to be able to go out and do what God has called you to do. That's the purpose of fivefold ministry. See, many churches are like the little Bo Peep kind of churches, you know? The modus operandi of a little Bo Peep was little Bo Peep has what? Lost her sheep. Doesn't know where to find them. Leave them alone. But Jesus was a good shepherd and he says in Luke 15, 4 that I go out. I'm apostolic. I go out. I'm about setting people free. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach, to heal, to deliver, to set free. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because I feel so good. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to do something. To do. Come on. Come on. Let's give God glory. To do. To set the captive free. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise be to his name. Come on, give him a shout. Thank you, Jesus.